Thank you, folks. I can see our attendees are coming in. Got a good number. Maybe get another 30 seconds here. Okay. James, go ahead and get started. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is a, a webinar briefing uh, for our really valued stakeholders here uh, to walk through some of the climate investments in the May revision of the state budget proposal unveiled this morning by Governor Newsom. I'm Lisa Lean Mager with the Natural Resources Agency. Um, and joining us today are Lauren Sanchez and Christine Hiranaka from the governor's office. And we also have leaders from uh, California Transportation Agency, uh, California Environmental Protection Agency, um, Natural Resources Agency, California Department of Food and Agriculture, and the governor's office of planning and research. Um, we have a few colleagues from the Department of Finance as well. Um, so, you know, we'll have folks give a brief overview and then we'll move in um, to Q&A and we'll use that Q&A function there at the bottom of your screen. And our team will work to get through as many as we can. But as always, if uh, we're not able to get to them, you can always follow up with us um, you know, via email and we'll, we'll try to uh, try to get answers in, uh, to any of your questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Lauren Sanchez, Senior Climate Advisor in the Office of Governor Gavin Newsom. Thanks so much, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. First and foremost, let me reaffirm our commitment to keeping our promises. This team has worked incredibly hard on a May revision budget proposal that, despite challenging fiscal conditions, continues to invest billions of dollars to dramatically cut carbon pollution, equitably grow our green economy, and support communities that are being impacted by the climate crisis. We're proud to be presenting a budget that continues to protect the vast majority of our climate budget and to share where a future climate bond can not only make up for some of the reductions we've had to make in January, but go even further to deliver on our climate agenda. As the governor said yesterday, our investments must, must match this reality of climate-driven extremes. This budget reflects California values. We believe the future is bright and we won't give up fighting for it. Californians always find a way. Science tells us that we need to act with great urgency. There are just 80 months left until 2030, the deadline that scientists have given us for whether or not we can save the planet. I am so proud to work with the team on today's call. Each day they and all of you are incredible partners across the state together with our legislature, give me hope and inspiration that the changes we need to achieve are in fact achievable. As you heard from Governor Newsom, California's estimated budget gap has grown, facing an additional $9.3 billion shortfall. But the, governing, but the governor is unwavering in his commitment to our world leading climate agenda. And as a result, he is not proposing additional cuts to the climate budget. The governor is also committed to working with the legislature on a climate bond to sustain and increase our investments in critical priorities. The May revision includes shifting funding from some programs that are well suited for a climate bond, which the team will cover in more detail. We also propose additional spending for two priorities, 290 million in funding to enhance flood protection and disaster relief on which Secretary Crowfoot will elaborate and resources to begin implementation of SBX 1-2, Senator Skinner's bill from the governor's special session to hold big oil accountable and stop them from fleecing Californians at the pump. There are two other important components of May revision that the governor covered and we are excited to elaborate on today. First, federal funding and second, expediting infrastructure projects. The governor is laser focused on positioning the state of California strategically to tap into federal funding opportunities. We recognize the importance of federal support in accelerating all of our climate initiatives. Through collaboration and advocacy, we are positioning ourselves to maximize funding from various sources. California has received about $48.6 billion in funding from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and about $645 million from the Inflation Reduction Act, 
with more climate funding to be announced. The state is positioning itself to be competitive for these funds, including by working with the legislature on additional green financing authority as detailed in the trailer bills to be posted today. We'll soon have more to say about how the administration is organizing this work. Another critical aspect of our strategy is expediting climate infrastructure projects. We understand the urgency of addressing the climate challenge and the need to deliver clean energy, clean transportation, and water projects at a faster pace to deliver on our ambitious climate goals. As the governor shared earlier this morning, we are looking forward to working with the legislature on statutory changes to expedite projects that advance California's climate, equity, and economic goals while maintaining appropriate environmental review. By reducing bureaucratic hurdles, we can expedite the implementation of innovative solutions that will drive our transition to a sustainable future. On a whole, this budget ensures that California is not backing down from our climate commitment. And our commitment to combating climate change is not just a slogan, it is embedded in our collective consciousness. Our communities, our businesses, and partners around the state, many of you on this call, have embraced the imperative for climate action. We are proud to be a beacon of hope, learning from, and inspiring partners worldwide. Together, we can create a legacy of climate action that will reverberate for generations to come. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for your tireless advocacy and endless partnership on all things climate. We are so looking forward to continuing the discussion over the coming months with you all and the legislature. And with that, let me introduce my partner in this effort, California Transportation Secretary, Tokes Omashakin. Thank you, Lauren. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for everything you're doing from the governor's office to lead us uh, on the climate front. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join this conversation and this update on how the budget uh, is impacting our efforts uh, on climate action. As you all heard from Governor Newsom, if you were able to tune in early today, as the state's overall fiscal picture grows a little darker, California's climate leadership continues to shine bright. As Lauren mentioned, the May revision continues to protect our state's critical investments to combat uh, the climate crisis. That includes maintaining the overall funding level that gov the governor proposed in January for the groundbreaking transportation infrastructure package last year to accelerate our transition to a cleaner, safer, more equitable uh, transportation system. I think that bears repeating. There's no change to the overall funding level for the transportation infrastructure package from what Governor Newsom proposed in January, even as the general fund shortfall is projected to grow. To quickly recap, the 2022 uh, Budget Act included a historic $13.8 billion for clean transportation programs and projects that align with the state's climate goals. In January, the governor's budget included $2.7 billion in general fund reductions, partially mitigated uh, by $500 million from state transportation funds to maintain overall $11.6 billion dollars, uh, roughly 85% of the uh, original proposed investments. And that's a really important point. These transformative state investments focused on creating a more sustainable and connected transportation system that puts people first and aligns with our core four priorities of safety, equity, climate action, and economic prosperity are already benefiting California communities, or they will soon be. Just a few weeks ago, my agency awarded more than $690 million to 28 new public transportation projects in underserved communities across the state. This is part of a historic, historic infusion of state funding to expand transit and passenger rail service throughout the state. These awards, Part of our transit and inner city rail capital program, also known as TRRCP, follow more than two and a half billion in January for a total state investment of more than $3.2 billion in public transportation in just the first four months, first four months 
of 2023. Again, $3.2 billion just this year alone in capital funding for transit. We've also invested $1 billion in active transportation projects to expand access to safe walking and biking options in underserved communities, with another $700 million more on the way uh, just uh, by the end of June. There's also $350 million in state funding that will soon be going to high priority um, uh, high priority uh, grade separation uh, projects across the state to reduce emissions and keep goods and people moving. Later this year, we also plan to award hundreds of millions to projects that support climate resiliency and reduce risk from climate impacts, as well as uh, do a call for projects for $150 million in the Highways to Boulevards pilot program that will help unify communities that have been divided by transportation infrastructure, increasing access to opportunity. The bottom line is this, as the largest contributor of climate warming pollution in California, transportation has to be a part of the solution. And in just the past few months, our state has invested billions of dollars to move towards a more multimodal, zero emission transportation future that reduces carbon emissions and improve public health. That is California climate leadership in action. These historic investments also continue to put California in a stronger position for significant federal funding through the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And just as a reference point, California has already received more than $14.8 billion in federal funding for transportation related projects from the IHA, including more than 2 billion through competitive uh, grant programs with our state funding commitments uh, having helped to secure those. So as I hand off to my colleague uh, and partner in this effort, uh, EPA Secretary Garcia, I wanna emphasize again, we are preserving our clean transportation funding commitments and communities throughout the state are already benefiting from the historic investments that we've made with billions more of state and federal, federal dollars on the way as we work to build a more sustainable and connected transportation system, focusing on putting people first and our core four priorities. Uh, with that, I want to hand things over to my friend and colleague, uh, Secretary Garcia. Secretary Thank Garcia. you. Thanks, Secretary Omashak, and thanks for all the work your team is carrying. Uh, Yana Garcia, Secretary for Environmental Protection. I'm going to pick up where Secretary Omashak left us off on the zero emission vehicles um, strategy and investment priority that we are continuing here. As you all know well, one of several key components of our pathways to achieve carbon neutrality as laid out in the Air Resources Board's 2022 scoping plan. The May revision continues our commitment to building out infrastructure and services that prepare the state for a zero emission future across the transportation sector. It includes an $8.9 billion investment in zero emission vehicles, reducing emissions caused by short haul trucks, electrifying school buses, supporting low income Californians and in purchasing cleaner vehicles and creating the charging and other infrastructure needed for the zero emission vehicle future we're building out. Specifically, we've retained $3.1 billion for the Energy Commission Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Programs while maintaining the governor's budget proposal to extend AB8 fee revenues, supporting long-term, consistent, predictable, and flexible investments in zero emission vehicles and charging infrastructure, as well as refueling infrastructure at the Energy Commission, the Air Resources Board, and the Bureau of Automotive Repair. Importantly, these funds will specifically target communities already overburdened by pollution with existing limited investments in zero emission infrastructure to address historical inequities and ensure that no one is left behind. Maintaining our commitment toward necessary zero emission investments also involves 635 million in a shift from the general fund to cap and trade funds to invest in projects that support a transition toward cleaner transportation technology, including in disadvantaged communities. We recently celebrated that 1.5 million zero emission vehicles have been sold in the state two years ahead of schedule. That means that we continue to lead in charting the path toward clean air and climate change solutions. And I'm especially proud of our ongoing focus on cleaning the trucks that travel on our roads and throughout too many of our communities. 
CARB has already invested $1.2 billion in projects for both passenger and heavy duty vehicles with a goal of reducing air pollution in communities that face the greatest burdens. Now I'd like to touch on another important aspect of our climate agenda, ensuring long-term stewardship of our lands and economic as well as water resilience, an investment that's reflected in our environmental protection package to continue to sub support sustainable pest management or SPM, a key priority area for us and a key partnership area with our colleagues at the Department of Food and Agriculture, Secretary Karen Ross. Now, as many of you know, in 2021, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, Cal EPA and CDFA convened a cross-sector work group to identify ambitious goals and actions to transition to sustainable pest management in agriculture and across urban communities. That group's roadmap was released in January of this year. Through the May revision, we've proposed initial funding to begin implementing the work outlined in the roadmap, which includes streamlining and improving timelines for the department's registration evaluation processes, identifying alternatives to high-risk fumigants, and leading strategic collaborations with stakeholders and agency partners to plan for and implement the roadmap. Similarly critical to protecting health and the environment, the Exide cleanup in Southern California is front of mind for me and for many. The May revision includes $67.3 million from the lead acid battery cleanup fund over two years, including $40.4 million in budget year 23-24 and $26.9 million in 24-25 to clean up 6,425 parkways surrounding the former Exide Technologies facility identified with high levels of lead and other metals. This proposal importantly builds out on this administration and the legislature's ongoing commitment to protecting communities and the environment from exposure to hazardous chemicals after Exide shirked its responsibility to clean up its contamination and bankruptcy courts subsequently let it off the hook. This investment will work toward removing pathways of exposure for Southeast LA residents, including children surrounding the former Exide facility. Now, let me also briefly address critical water actions and investments, something Secretary Wade Crowfoot will also speak to in a moment, as well as Secretary Ross. We begin this year contending with simultaneous drought and flood emergencies, exemplifying the climate-induced intensification of the swings in California's natural cycle of flood and drought. The governor's proposed revisions to the 23-24 budget protect our key water priorities and continue to use the governor's water supply strategy as a roadmap. They preserve funding for both drinking water and clean water projects from prior budgets while meeting commitments for assistance to disadvantaged communities and supporting groundwater sustainability. We've had significant rainfall this year, but groundwater levels have not recovered, and we still have many households experiencing dry wells. So to balance the needs created by the climate whiplash we've experienced, we're investing $55 million from the current budget year's drought contingency funds to address flood needs, while we are continuing to meet our commitment to ensuring sufficient funding for emergency drinking water for the remainder of this year and next. This will go specifically to purchase bottled and hauled water to ensure our most vulnerable communities have the urgent support they need to, make their to meet their most basic of household needs. The May revision also preserves $1.3 billion in state infrastructure investments to help disadvantaged communities achieve long-term solutions for drinking water and wastewater needs. The State Water Board has already committed $450 million of this historic funding to projects including new wells, treatment, consolidations, and septic to sewer, to sewer projects. Additionally, matching funds the state secured in last year's budget for the drinking water and clean water state revolving funds allow us to continue to leverage hundreds of millions of dollars in bipartisan infrastructure law funding to provide grants for projects in disadvantaged communities and to finance low interest loans for major projects like water recycling. Though the declining budget conditions since the governor's January budget requires reduction in, reductions in funding in various areas, we also remain committed to investments that are consistent with the water supply strategy, as I mentioned, and which meet important equity goals. Reflecting this commitment, the May revision includes a shift of $270 million for water recycling to a future climate bond consistent with what the governor mentioned this morning and in January. Currently, the State Water Board has another $240 million available for financing water recycling projects and expects to commit all of this funding during the 23-24 fiscal year. Now, as a point of reference, recycling projects that received funding in 22-23 are projected to provide around 170,000 acre feet annually in recycled wastewater, helping the state reach its goal to recycle and reuse 800,000 acre feet by the end of 2020. Ultimately, the May revision preserves our ability to continue to invest in major projects and to sustain forward movement in our efforts to prepare for and mitigate the impacts of extreme weather and a changing climate. 
Finally, the revision makes an important investment in the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It includes $4.8 million in general fund in 23-24 and 24-25 to support the State Water Board's critical oversight role for basins deemed inadequate as required by the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. This support will enable the board to meaningfully protect and manage groundwater basins while helping sustainability agencies resume local control. Reaching groundwater sustainability, as you all know well, is key to the state's water future, and this funding will help the board meaningfully carry out its critical role. I want to thank our colleagues at the Department of Finance and so many of you for the ongoing work that you're carrying forward during some challenging times, and I will hand it over to my colleague, Director Sam Acefa, who will talk a little bit about our community resilience efforts. Director Acefa. Thank you so much, Secretary Garcia, and thank you for your leadership in this space since uh, you took uh, the helm at APA, but also uh, long before that. And I also want to thank Tox and Lauren. Uh, it's great to be in your company on this uh, important work. Uh, and thank you, everyone who who's participating as well. Uh, a lot of you are uh, leaders as well in this space. Uh, I am Sam Asafa, I'm the Director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Uh, OPR is the state's uh, land use planning agency that oversees direct investment programs and policy and innovation around uh, resiliency, equity, economic development, uh, and, and uh, focus on the built environment. Uh, protecting communities, uh, infrastructure, and the built environment against climate impacts is the back, uh, the, the bedrock of the administration's climate agenda. To ensure we are all, uh, we are all on track, the May revision retains a significant amount of the original heat and community resilience budget. I'll briefly walk you through some of OPR's and state uh, partners programs within our heat and commu community resilience agenda, as well as proposed modifications in funding. California Natural Resources Agency's Urban Greening Program will maintain $50 million in funding for nature-based uh, projects uh, that greet schools, parks, trails, and other public spaces, uh, improve stormwater management, and enhance natural ecosystems. In addition, $100 million will be shifted to the proposed climate bond. OPR's Extreme Heat and Community Resilience Program will maintain $100 million in funding to plan and protect communities and vulnerable populations against heat-related uh, vulnerabilities and risks to the built environment. Uh, Cal Fire's urban forestry program, including green school yards, will maintain $80 million for projects enhancing urban and community forests which provide important benefits in terms of air quality, public health, infrastructure resilience, and habitat conservation. Outside of the extreme heat package, an additional $100 million for green school yards is also maintained in the May, May revision. OPR's Community Resilience Center program will maintain $110 million in funding with an additional $160 million shifted to the proposed climate bond. The program will fund new construction and upgrades of neighborhood level resilience centers to provide shelter and resources during climate related and other emergencies as well as support for the program year round. OPR's regional climate resilience grant program will maintain $25 million in funding with an additional 100 million shifted to the climate bond for planning and implementation of projects responding to California region's greatest climate risks. OPR's Transformative Climate Communities Program will maintain $215 million in funding and an additional $100 million shifted to the climate bond for communities most impacted by the effects of climate change to plan and implement holistic neighborhood level climate resilience projects. Together, these programs are helping build local knowledge and planning capacity, creating strong social networks and effective communities and enhancing infrastructure and the built environment to strengthen overall community and heat preparedness protection and resilience. Uh, I want to thank the governor for actually, even at the difficult budget times, maintaining significantly 
uh, the investments that he uh, promised in, in, in climate. So with that, I will hand it off to my good friend, Secretary Crawford, um, to walk you over in more detail. Sam, thanks so much and appreciate everybody being on this call. I think we have, believe it or not, almost a thousand people on this call. And I imagine everybody or almost everybody on this call is spending a lot of their time and energy combating climate change and protecting people and nature from the impacts of, of accelerating climate. And so I just wanted to thank you for the work that you do. All of us, I think, are working with an urgency and focus that is really, really productive, even at the same time that, you know, Mother Nature continues to surprise and this weather whiplash gets more intense. So just just a, mo you know, a word, big thanks that all you do. And of course, for uh, all, all my colleagues as well. Um, I'm just going to detail some highlights of, of the May revise, but I think I would say at the highest level, um, I think the key takeaway is, you know, the governor and legislature with your advocacy came together last year to announce a bit of a, a mind numbing uh, figure on climate investment, $54 billion. And that's going to let us actually make so much progress toward our world leading climate targets. And then despite the economy and therefore our state budget going in the opposite direction uh, in the coming year, um, we've maintained essentially 90% of that investment. The governor's Jan 10 budget uh, was at $48 billion for climate. Uh, and we're retaining that, about $48 billion for, for climate uh, in this May revise, despite the fact that between this past January and five months later now in May, uh, our budget gap, our revenue gap has increased by $30 billion. So I'm really proud of the commitment and the, and the funding we have. But of course, we have so much work ahead of us. Um, I'll, I'll take, pick up where Secretary Garcia left off uh, on water. Uh, she obviously, as leading EPA, leads a lot of our water work uh, with the state water board. And then, of course, we with Department of Water Resources and Fish and Wildlife do a lot Two, um, we were obviously experiencing this weather whiplash, uh, which is quite intense and therefore requires us to both continue to make drought investments, but uh, to shift uh, some of our funding to drought investments. A lot of progress already on the ground as a result of funding over the last uh, couple of years. Overall water funding, $8.5 billion, um, essentially 97% of which is uh, being maintained uh, in our proposal in the coming year. Lots of progress to note on the ground, including over the last couple of years, $68 million in grant funding to recharge projects across the state, recharging about 117,000 acre feet of water, getting them back into the groundwater basins as we drive sustainable groundwater management. Um, a lot of attention gets focused sometimes on, on big infrastructure projects, but what I'm most energized by is the funding we've been able to provide to local water agencies, including small water agencies, to improve their drought resilience. And that's been replacing hundreds of miles of leaking pipes, installing storage take for emergencies, connecting the larger water systems, um, modernizing and deepening wells where needed. Um, you know, from very small unincorporated communities to large cities, state funding is uh, providing for those improvements. So that's re a really good thing. Um, I want to talk about flood uh, flood funding and make the point that even during the driest three-year period that we experienced uh, up until this past October, since 2019, when Governor Newsom took office, we've invested $1.3 billion in flood safety. And these were all investments that were made during that dry period that drew down well over two billion dollars of federal funding and those improvements in our flood safety infrastructure uh, were, uh, were performed during these recent uh, flood events and atmospheric rivers in the governor's january proposal which was actually put together before the atmospheric rivers in january we called for an additional 202 million dollars of uh, of increased flood investment this may revision goes on top of that and proposes an additional $290 million uh, on top of the $202 million of additional funding we were proposing back in January. So significant increase in flooding, including $125 million for a flood contingency um, uh, account, which essentially allows us to spend money quickly 
If it's approved, it allows us to spend money quickly on flood situations that could emerge as this prodigious snowpack melts. Uh, also includes $75 million for our subventions program, which is our state uh, subsidy or investment in the local match needed to secure federal funding for important flood safety projects, including the Pajaro River flood management project that's obviously so important uh, in the Central Coast. This flood funding also includes $25 million to small uh, uh, farmers, specifically for direct assistance to businesses that have been impacted by recent storms. And then an additional $25 million, which is essentially a disaster response account uh, to augment that flood contingency plan. So I'm, I'm excited to make the case for increased flood uh, funding, even as we continue to make investments in our drought resilience. Now, as Lauren mentioned, the governor redoubled his commitment to a climate bond uh, when he announced his May revision today. I think a lot of us are very excited about that because we recognize we need to maintain generational commitments uh, in, our, uh, in our climate resilience and our climate budget if we're not only going to meet the climate goals that the state has, but really keep up with accelerating climate impacts. <clears throat> Important to note that um, a portion of our climate budget, a uh, small portion, but but still significant, um, are, we're proposing to shift into a general obligation bond <clears throat> that we and the governor are committed to uh, finding uh, a, an aligned proposal with the legislature during the remainder of this legislative session. Uh, items that, that we're proposing to shift into that general obligation bond, including include funding for the Salton Sea, which I work directly on, uh, shifting $169 million there, um, $60 million for Sigma implementation. It's worth noting there have been hundreds of millions of dollars of state investment, but $60 million of that we're proposing to shift into a bond, $50 million of our dam safety and flood management uh, work, and $20 million of our multi-benefit land repurposing. So I know many of you are, are, are interested and eager to engage in fleshing out what that climate bond will be. And we look forward to that conversation in weeks and months to come. All of these water investments are made according to both our water resilience portfolio that was put together in 2020, and then our updated and more focused water supply strategy for a hotter, drier future, which was released last August. Um, so let me move to wildfire and forest resilience, obviously another critical climate resilience priority. Simply put, the governor legislature, again, with your advocacy, have allocated almost, well, $2.7 billion uh, in a three-year period for upfront proactive actions uh, to get our hands around this catastrophic wildfire crisis. That's, that's be above and beyond all the funding that's augmented CAL FIRE response to fires once they start. This funding is making a difference, funding over 1,200 projects across the state um, that are either completed or in progress to protect communities and landscapes from a catastrophic wildfire. Um, the May revision, essentially no changes from the January 10 uh, proposed budget on wildfire. That is to say, we're retaining 98% of the multi-year budget for the coming year that was agreed upon last year. And we're making a bunch of progress, which we're excited to report on through our uh, wildfire task force, which met yesterday in the Central Coast. I want to next touch on nature-based solutions, which is an area of, of passion for a lot of us, and that is investing in restoring and supporting our natural systems in ways that benefit our environment and uh, people. Uh, so thanks to the legislature, the governor, uh, over the last couple of years, $1.6 billion of dollars invested into nature-based solutions, which is a large category of, of projects. That includes uh, funding into the Wildlife Conservation Board and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It includes a tribal nature-based solutions program, which we are actively finalizing guidelines for in next coming months. And that's funding that will go directly to tribes includes funding through the Department of Conservation for our multi-benefit land repurposing projects to really help where there are voluntary efforts to shift uh, land, agricultural land into other purposes as we implement Sigma. Um, so much work, wildlife crossings, uh, conservation core, et cetera. 
um, as well as uh, applications for our green schoolyards uh, work. Now, this May revision maintains 89% of what was uh, agreed upon or envisioned last year under a very different budget scenario. Um, very little change from the January 10 uh, proposal into, into the May revise. Um, we also prioritize equitable access to our outdoors, recognizing getting uh, into parks and open space is critically important for physical and mental health, and that that access is not equitable across the state. In coming days, we will release a draft strategy of our Outdoors for All initiative, and that's work that's well underway whether that's the um, billion dollars that the governor and the legislature have invested in the last couple of years in putting parks in park poor communities or creating uh, programs to get young people into parks, or even changing and modernizing the way we, uh, we share our history in parks, uh, including a really landmark partnership between our California African American Museum uh, in our agency and our state parks department to reinterpret uh, Black history in several state parks across the state. So we're really excited about this work. And of course, uh, one of the flagships is the creation of our newest state park at Dos Rios Ranch Preserve. Um, I'll mention that uh, in those flood investments that we talked about, I should have mentioned the $40 million of restoration for multi-benefit floodplains in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, one of those floodplains is at Dos Rios, which is becoming a state park. And we envision more of those types of projects across the San Joaquin Valley as a result of that um, of that uh, flood funding. Um, so access, uh, equitable access remains a major priority. Uh, minimal changes between May revision and January. And overall, we're retaining about 83% of what was envisioned for access in a very different budget reality. Last area is coastal resilience, critically important given sea level rise and storm surge and coastal erosion and increased temperature and acidification of, of waters impacting both coastal communities and ecosystems. The legislature governor made a huge quantum leap investment uh, in, in coastal resilience uh, in recent years and, and particularly last year making great progress on that, including land return projects um, to tribes, as well as improved scientific monitoring, work to both restore and better understand our kelp forests off the coast. Uh, the May revision really leaves the proposed budget from January 10 for coastal resilience unchanged, um, and meaning we have upwards of almost 60 percent of uh, of that coastal resilience budget envisioned last year that we're that we're retaining um, for this critical priority. So thanks for your patience as we move through that. That climate budget is an expansive uh, category, and so we want to provide you as much information on what you might be interested in as we can. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague and friend, our Agriculture Secretary, Karen Ross. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot, and thanks everyone for being on the call today every one of you. Um, appreciate the work that you do on an annual basis to be that the effective advocates that you are in addition to our partnership with the legislature. Um, I'm, ex I I'm really pleased with this budget given the difficult times that we're facing of the commitment of the governor with his leadership, the hard work of the Department of Finance and the governor's office, as well as my own staff of really working hard to put together this commitment that shows the administration's commitment to investing in the resiliency of our working lands, of our food systems, and of our rural communities. That's demonstrated by the fact that almost 90% of the historic investments that have been made in agriculture over the past two years are protected with this budget. Consistent with the January proposed budget, this includes protecting investments in climate smart agriculture, specifically $48 million in our livestock methane reduction programs, as well as $70 million for the Healthy Soils Program in the current year, even after taking a $15 million reduction that was in the January budget. There is also, I wanna point out, $10 million for Healthy Soils Program in the 23-24 um, budget. Um, we also have programs that have been mentioned by Secretary Crowfoot um, that are critical to producer and food system resiliency to drought and other extreme weather incidents, such as flooding and extreme heat. 
Among those investments at the Department of Food and Agriculture is $15 million for water efficiency technical assistance program, as well as protecting $10 million in current year funding for our state water efficiency and enhancement program, the SWEEP program, um, which combined with the previous two-year funding cycle ensures that there will be $70 million for an upcoming solicitation for the SWEEP program. Um, Wade already mentioned $25 million in the budget for an agricultural relief program for flooding. This is $25 million that's being added to Agobia's agricultural business relief program. $75 million was proposed in the January budget for drought relief. And with the May revise, there'll be an additional $25 million in this budget year for flood relief. I wanna to shift to the important investments that we have been making in essential nutrition programs that provide access to healthy local foods for all Californians. Um, within this budget is $60 million in current year funding for the Farm to School program. I wanna thank the first partner for her championship of this program. That paired with $30 million of investment in 21-22 is supporting 1.6 million students 163 school districts, 50 farms, and seven food hubs as part of this incubator program. There's also $10 million for the California Nutrition Incentives Program, which draws down matching dollars from the federal um, USDA programs for getting nutrition assistance out to Californians. And we will have six to $6.2 million for our urban ag program that will be distributed yet this year. Um, I want to thank Secretary Garcia for her partnership and co-leadership in the Sustainable Pest Management Work Group. I just wanted to call that work out because of the many Californians, and hopefully some of you are on this line, who participated as work group members. Two years of hard work to release the roadmap in January of this year. Um, that roadmap continues California leadership on a path towards healthy, resilient ecosystems that include our farms and working lands, as well as cities, suburbs, and our public spaces. Look forward to continuing to partner with the Department of Pesticide Regulation, Secretary Garcia, and the work group members in advancing this modest budget proposal for DPR and CDFA's work to expand the reach of the Sustainable Pest Management Program. Um, I wanna summarize that this is an important work and it's new work that we've stood up with the governor's leadership around climate smart agriculture, as well as local healthy resilient food systems. Uh, look forward to continuing that work with all of you and my partners here in this call today. And would like to introduce Christine Haranoka from the governor's office to touch on our energy work. Thanks, Christine. It's always great to see you. Thank you, Secretary. And I will try to keep this short so we have some time for questions. Uh, as, as we all know, climate change is causing unprecedented stress on the grid and underscores the urgency that we must build the clean, reliable, affordable, and safe energy system of the future. The May revision preserves nearly all the funding from the governor's Jan 10 budget, which is about $6.9 billion, which includes $2.8 billion for the state's clean energy investments and programs, and $3.4 billion for energy reliability efforts. In addition, and consistent with last year's SB 846, the mayor revision provides details on the $1 billion to implement the Clean Energy Reliability Investment Plan, which will support transmission planning, greater community engagement, initial funding for a central procurement mechanism to support the development of long lead time resources, efforts to address interconnection and permanent delays, investments to scale demand side resources that improve demand flexibility, support energy efficiency, Agency and expand vehicle to grid integration and vehicle to building capabilities, investments to scale um, supply side resources such as geothermal, offshore wind, and long duration storage, and lastly, investments to expand the resources available during extreme events in the state. Um, and I'll just conclude with a, a note that the budget also will address the structural deficit in the CC's primary operating fund. This will enable the CC to continue its critical work, including on building and applied standards, and will continue to save Californians more money. Uh, with that, thank you so much. And I'll hand it back over to Lisa. Thanks, Christine. Um, I know our team's uh, able to write 
quite a few um, written answers to the questions as they're coming in and we'll keep doing that. But um, we do have a few minutes here. So we'll try to group some of the themes that are coming in. Um, a few folks are asking about damage that we're seeing from the extreme storms this winter and wondering if we're seeing this as a trend and does this underscore the need um, to really uh, Make, make sure we're building our climate resiliency. And one of these questions maybe we'd be throw to you, they're asking specifically about coastal resilience and emphasizing natural solutions. So, you know, ultimately what's our, what's our approach gonna be to that knowing that we're looking at all these extremes? Yeah, well, the phrase weather whiplash is, is, is not far from anyone, anyone's tongue these days, given just what we've experienced you know, 7% of our state burning in the last three years, the hottest and longest heat wave in the history of the American West just last September, the driest three-year period shifting two months later to the wettest three-week period. So clearly we have to continue to invest uh, unprecedented funding into building our resilience. We also have to help communities and regions prepare for all of these threats. Um, while we have very specific funding on flood or drought or wildfire extreme heat, all of this is shaped by our California adaptation strategy, which is really connecting dots across all those sectoral efforts. And that is driven by six key priorities. First and foremost is prioritizing protection for the most vulnerable communities uh, to, to climate change. Um, within this, nature-based solutions are lifted up. They're actually one of the six priorities uh, in that adaptation strategy that's driving all of these specific sectoral investments. We need to help nature help us. Um, when we restore ecological function, whether it's a floodplain or an urban canopy, uh, we not only uh, help ourselves and protect ourselves from impacts, but we protect the rest of life across California, which we know as biodiversity. So I'm really bullish on, I'm really optimistic about these investments because I think California leaders understand um, that we have to do more than we've ever done and we have to seek to achieve multiple benefits from all of our investments. Thank you, Wade. Um, looking at a question here from Lena, um, probably for Secretary Ross or, or for finance, she's wondering if the 6.2 million for urban agriculture um, that that Secretary Ross mentioned is new money for FY24 or existing funds that are being protected and not cut? I'm um, sorry, I should have clarified that. Thanks for the question. These are funds that are being protected. Um, there, there was a reduction of the original amount, but we've been able to protect this for this year and look forward to putting those grants to work and evaluating the results and learning lessons to take forward. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, so a question from um, folks in, interested in knowing what's happening uh, with funding for the New River uh, in Calexico and in Imperial County. Um, what is the status of that funding? Looking at maybe finance can answer that one. Yeah, I, I'll I'll let I'll turn it over to finance. But we have um, funding currently moving forward that and are actually excited to to announce the um, building of the. Um, diversion at the New River in Calexico. So that is actually moving forward currently. Yeah, and I would just thank Yana and her team for their partnership where we've all been working together on this. And this is a really good example where we're really leaning in to support um, a community, in this case, Calexico, um, really proactively rather than you know sitting back and having grant programs that are siloed um, and being reactive to communities. And some communities don't have the capacity to navigate how complex our grant environment has been. We've really been proactive with Calexico and bringing different sources of funding to bear for that diversion project, which as Secretary Garcia uh, mentions, we're, we're going to celebrate the beginning or the initiation of very soon. Thank you. Um, Eric is asking um, uh, again about nature-based solutions. Um, is the May revise identifying some of that uh, as funding that could get shifted to the bond? Wait, I think you touched on that, but maybe just expand a bit. Yeah, well, I think that there's there's clearly an unprecedented amount of general fund that remains for nature-based solutions. So I think that's uh, one point of progress that we're making sure that there's a significant funding uh, in all of these areas for nature-based solutions. I also think over time, we're going to institutionalize nature-based solutions, so it's less of a specific category. But then I, I anticipate that within the bond that the 
The governor will, you know, explore with the legislature in coming months. I, I'm confident that nature-based solutions will be a central part of that discussion. Thanks, Wade. To put a finer point on uh, Wade's uh, comments there, uh, to be clear, uh, the May revision is maintaining 89% of the nature-based solution um, investments. And uh, in terms of shifting to the bond, there was $20 million for the multi-benefit land repurposing program uh, that we would reckon that we're uh, proposing shifting to a bond. Thanks, Matt. Um, question uh, here from Tilly asking about the status of the urban greening program funding. I think we had some written questions like that as well. Um, and anyone want to just give a, a quick overview with where we stand on the urban and community forestry program administered by Cal Fire? Yeah, Matt can correct me, but I believe that's one um, area where we're proposing a hundred million dollar shift uh, from the proposed general fund into the general obligation bond. Yep, that is correct. Great, thank you. There's a few questions um, about OPR's TCC program. I know Sam had a hard stop, but um, perhaps Finance can help with this. If not, we can follow up. But they're wondering uh, how, um, if any, this will impact TCC awardees during FY22-23. Yeah, um, I think what we could say is, is that we're not proposing taking away money that's already been committed. So if the if the money's been committed, um, you know it's protected. Uh, most of the pullbacks and fund shifts are really prospective money that hasn't been committed yet. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, one question here from Abe asking that, well, Californians are waiting for um, rebates from the Inf Inflation Reduction Act um, for things like heat pumps and other incentives. Can California speed up the delivery of these rebates uh, so they don't have to wait till 2024? Uh, not sure if our, uh, our colleagues here might be able to answer that. That's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's within the power of the state in terms of federal funds, but it's definitely something to look into um, as we look at, again, the administration's priorities for pulling down as much federal funding as possible. I will point you to, um, and my colleague Christine can cover if there are additional questions, the administration and legislature have dedicated almost a billion dollars to equitable building decarbonization. So there's a ton of state funds already going to those types of rebates for clean appliances and retrofits of low-income and multifamily homes. Um, so more details on the state funding side of that within the energy package. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so uh, Laura's got a comment thanking uh, folks for the interagency work that's happening in the Central Valley right now uh, with regard to flood control and um, just that cooperation that we're seeing uh, between the state and feds. And then she asks, how can folks on this call um, support the governor's proposal to change permitting laws to expedite the green slash just economy that we need? Um, I think the governor might have alluded to a little bit of that this morning, but um, I'm not sure if anybody wants to expand a bit. Yeah, I'll take that on. So simply put, we need to move fast to build the climate infrastructure that will allow us to meet our, our, our pollution reduction goals and carbon neutrality, but also protect our communities from climate change, whether that's clean energy infrastructure or clean transportation infrastructure, or in, in, in my case, habitat restoration. And so we have a system that doesn't, doesn't allow us to move as quickly as we need to. So I think the governor was very clear. He's really focused on how do we uh, accelerate projects? How do we accelerate this? We we clearly need to understand, you know, environmental impacts and seek to avoid, minimize, mitigate those impacts. But how do we simply get good projects done more quickly? I think that's what we're going to need. And so the governor highlighted in his address today that in coming days or weeks, um, there'll be more of a specific proposal coming out of the governor's office around um, some some reform of our processes to to do just that. 
Yeah, I, I would just add, I, I think I think so many of you among this group of folks joining us here late on a Friday afternoon are probably hard at work building the types of coalitions that we need on the ground to be able to partner with, to be able to draw down some of these dollars and make sure that they're successful in their implementation. And so to the extent that you're already doing that work, that you're doing that through existing programs like our Climate Catalyst program and other programs administered through the state, we want to see that continue and that will only help us, I think, be best positioned to, to make these investments successful and be able to draw down funding. Thanks, Jana. I think maybe we'll sneak in one more question, and this one's going to go to Tokes, I think. Um, Denny's asking about um, the scoping plan and the you know, goal to really reduce um, per capita VMT, vehicle miles travel by 2030. Um, I, I, the question kind of centers around how can we be supporting transit and all of those things to help us get to that goal? Well, look, it, it's a it's a key part of how we see uh, things improving from a from a cl climate front. It is continuing to invest in transit, uh, and this budget does exactly does exactly that. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, just this year alone, within the first four months, uh, the governor has uh, we've been allowed to move forward with a little over three billion dollars, three point two five billion dollars for transit capital investments. That's going to help with VMT, but the challenge uh, that maybe is probably being referred to here also is the fact that we know transit agencies are, you know, struggling a bit as it relates to uh, operations, um, uh, operations related funding. This uh, this week, I, I was in uh, in Southern California, Northern California, with our team hosting uh, listening sessions to hear directly from transit agencies about what some of their concerns, uh, uh, some of the challenges that they see uh, on the forefront as it relates to operations. And we're uh, committed. The governor mentioned it today in his, re in his thorough remarks. I think it was one of the questions. We're interested in continuing the partnership with the state legislature uh, as the budget uh, moves forward to see what can be done to possibly help with, with transit operations. But uh, from a VMT standpoint, transit is absolutely key. Uh, we're doing all we can from a, a capital standpoint uh, uh, to support transit agencies uh, across the state. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tokes. Um, I know we're at time. Any, um, any closing comments from any of our panelists here be, uh, before we close out? Thank you so much. Huge, Lisa, just a huge amount of gratitude to everyone who joined us today and to everyone who um, broadly plays a really important role in this state's climate agenda. We wouldn't be here today without you all, and we certainly aren't going to get this budget over the finish line without you all. So a lot more work to be done on this and the climate bond and infrastructure projects and protecting our communities, and we can't wait to partner with you all. Great. All right. Else want to jump in? All right. <laughs> well said. Maybe we can. Ditto. Thank you. <laughs>